terrible thing happened at night, as most terrible things do, while I clicked away at my home job as a transcriptionist. I'd often watch the boys playing in the backyard. They'd be at it for hours, acting out some scene with foam swords and plastic guns, only stopping when the sun left to rise up elsewhere. Seeing Mason made me happy. He'd finally found a friend. His father left us when he was six months old and more or less held no role in his life. I mean, sure, there were the occasional visits every few years, but even those were short and faint, not even so much as an annual birthday card. Perhaps that was why Mason anchored himself at such a secure distance from other kids, a point driven home by his fifth grade teacher and several others. Part of me didn't blame him. Kids in school, especially the ones I can recall, weren't the friendliest bunch. I mean, if you were lucky, you could pick out the sharks from the minnows and avoid them. But honestly, they all looked the same, twined together in the same concrete box. Give him a best friend, I'd whisper at my bedside every night, sending out the same message to God, or at least to something just as benevolent to hear my prayer. Give my son his first best friend, please. And then one day, much to my wonderment, Mason brought Todd home for a play date. He was a petite boy with mismatched clothes, unkempt hair, and the bluest eyes that you'd ever seen. I was ecstatic, relieved that my son had finally cracked open his shell and found a buddy. I saw him at the park, Mason told me when I asked how they met. He was sitting alone at the swings like he was sad. And when he saw me on my bike, he waved and I waved back. And then we hung out and he was really cool. As he shared this, I couldn't help but smile at his excitement. So much deserved by the loneliest boy in the world. That night, they had a sleepover and passed out in the living room. From my bedroom, I could hear the muffled speech of our television, which they had left on. Sighing, I untucked myself out of bed and walked sluggishly down to the stairs to them. Light from the screen pulsed and stretched over the sleeping boys. Mason was the streetlights. Swaddled in his blanket on the floor, Mason looked peaceful, and Todd seemed content, occasionally fidgeting with the rocks they had collected. A few days later, Mason excitedly burst into the house after school, his backpack swinging wildly. Mom, can Todd stay for dinner? Please, 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 he pleaded. I couldn't resist his enthusiasm and agreed. The boys chatted animatedly about school, their favorite subjects, and the peculiar insects they'd encountered during recess. As we sat around the dinner table, the warmth of shared laughter and stories filled the room. Todd, with his mismatched clothes and unkempt hair, fit seamlessly into our little family scene. It was heartening to see Mason's world expanding beyond the confines of his lonelier days. After dinner, the boys retreated to Mason's room to play video games and share secrets, their camaraderie growing stronger with each passing day. Todd's presence brought an air of joy and vibrancy that had been absent for far too long. It was as if the universe had finally granted my whispered prayers for Mason to have a true friend. Weeks turned into months, and the bond between Mason and Todd deepened. They navigated the challenges of growing up together, supporting each other through triumphs and tribulations. I marveled at the transformation in Mason, who had blossomed into a more confident and socially engaged young boy. However, one evening as I passed by Mason's room, I overheard a hushed conversation. They spoke about a mysterious dream Todd had, 
one that left him unsettled. Intrigued, I lingered outside the door, eavesdropping on their imaginative exchange. The dream seemed to intertwine reality and fantasy, blurring the lines between what was possible and what existed only in the realm of dreams. As the days unfolded, the narrative of their adventures took unexpected turns, weaving a tapestry of mystery and wonder becoming out. I sighed, figuring the boys were caught up in a game or conversation. As I glanced towards Todd's front door, my eyes locked onto his bedroom window. Through the parted curtains, I saw Todd sitting on the sill, staring at me with those unnerving, pitch-black eyes. Panic surged through me, but I shook it off, telling myself it was a trick of the light. Finally, Mason emerged, and Todd joined him, waving from the window as they exchanged a few last words. The unease lingered, but I dismissed it, chalking it up to an overactive imagination. We drove home in relative silence, the weight of the encounter settling in the car like an unwelcome passenger, the way your message continues to unfold and I appreciate your detailed storytelling. Now, let's seamlessly integrate the new segment with the existing narrative. The smell of light orchid drifted throughout the air. I hope you like green tea, he said quietly, as he filled the cups and brought them over. Green is fine, I replied, taking the cup from him. Thank you. He planted himself in a chair. They're really fond of each other, aren't they? The boys, I mean. I'd say so. You could hardly keep Mason away, I laughed. By now, the rom-com in the living area had reached a dramatic climax. The canned laughter drowning out the sound of our conversation. David's eyes shifted uneasily towards the woman on the sofa. That's my wife, Grace. She's not feeling well lately, he explained, his voice barely audible over the TV. Grace remained absorbed in the movie, seemingly oblivious to our presence. As we waited, David and I exchanged polite small talk, discussing the weather, the neighborhood, and the peculiarities of children. The clock on the wall ticked away, each second intensifying the awkward atmosphere in the room. Finally, the front door creaked open, and Mason and Todd stumbled in, their faces flushed with excitement. Hi, Mom. Hi, David. Mason greeted us, his enthusiasm momentarily breaking the heavy silence. Sorry we took so long, Todd added, glancing at me with a curious expression. His eyes, however, were back to their vivid blue, and I tried to suppress the unease that had lingered since that night in the car. It's no problem, I replied, forcing a smile. We were just keeping David company. The boys exchanged knowing glances, and a strange energy hung in the air. We found something amazing in the woods, Mason exclaimed his eyes sparkling with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. As they excitedly recounted their discoveries, I couldn't shake the feeling that our lives were spiraling into a narrative beyond my control, a story that transcended the boundaries of reality and imagination. Little did I know that the threads of their tale would weave into our lives unraveling the fabric of normalcy and leading us into an unforeseen realm of mystery and uncertainty. Over the next few days, I noticed subtle changes in Mason. He seemed more withdrawn, his laughter less frequent. When I asked about his time with Todd, he'd smile weakly and assure me everything was fine. The unease I felt persisted a nagging suspicion that something was amiss. One evening, 
as Mason and Todd played in the backyard, I overheard fragments of their conversation. Todd spoke of dreams, of realms beyond our understanding. Mason listened attentively, his expression a mix of fascination and trepidation. My concern deepened. A few nights later, Mason woke me up, his face pale and anxious. Mom, Todd wants to show us something. Something amazing, he said, his eyes reflecting a strange blend of excitement and fear. Reluctantly, I followed them to the woods behind our house, where Todd claimed a portal to another world existed. In the dim moonlight, Todd's eyes glowed eerily, and a chill ran down my spine. He spoke of a place where dreams and reality intertwined, a realm only accessible through this mysterious portal. Mason, captivated by the idea, urged me to believe. As we stood on the threshold of the woods, uncertainty gripped me. The fine line between reason and the fantastic blurred, and I struggled to discern truth from imagination. Todd's words echoed in my mind, and for a moment, I hesitated. What awaited us beyond the veil of reality? The story unfolded, taking unexpected turns, leaving me torn between the mundane world I knew and the enigmatic realm Todd spoke of. The narrative took on a life of its own, leaving me on the precipice of a surreal adventure, unsure of what lay ahead. Anxiety, the backyard, once a haven of familiarity, now felt like a place draped in shadows and uncertainty. I took a deep drag from the cigarette, the ember glowing brightly in the gathering dusk. As the clock on my phone ticked closer to eight, I hesitated before dialing the number. A mix of apprehension and curiosity swirled within me. What kind of help did David need? What secrets lurked behind the closed doors of his home? Finally, summoning courage, I pressed the call button. The phone rang, each chime echoing the heavy anticipation in my chest. A tense silence enveloped me until, unexpectedly, someone answered on the other end, a low, raspy voice that sent a chill down my spine. Holly, the voice croaked. I'm glad you called. There's something you need to know about Todd and Mason, something that transcends the ordinary. I listened intently, my eyes darting nervously between the flickering flames and the darkening sky. The voice spoke of hidden realms, ancient mysteries, and a pact forged in shadows. It wove a tale of the extraordinary, blurring the lines between the mundane and the fantastical. As the conversation unfolded, I felt a weight lifting from my shoulders, replaced by an unsettling understanding. The world I thought I knew had layers, intricacies that eluded my grasp. Todd and Mason were not mere children. They were players in a cosmic game, bound by forces beyond my comprehension. The call ended, leaving me with a sense of foreboding. Night settled over the neighborhood, casting long shadows that whispered secrets of the unknown. The fire pit's flames danced, mirroring the chaos of emotions within me. In the days that followed, I grappled with newfound knowledge, my perception of reality forever altered. Todd and Mason's friendship held the key to unraveling mysteries that extended beyond our suburban existence. The note, the cryptic call, each piece of the puzzle pointed to a narrative far grander than the confines of our ordinary lives. As I ventured deeper into this enigmatic journey, I couldn't shake the feeling that the threads of fate were weaving a tapestry that entwined the destinies of our families. The story, far from reaching its conclusion, beckoned us into uncharted territory 
a realm where the ordinary blurred with the extraordinary, and the boundaries between reality and fantasy dissolved into the night. Sharply, my voice more resolute than I intended, Mason's smile faded, replaced by a look of disappointment. Why not, Mom? he questioned, a hint of frustration in his tone. I hesitated, struggling to find the right words. It's just not a good time, sweetie. Maybe next time. Mason sighed, but didn't press further. I retreated to my room, the weight of the evening settling on my shoulders. The cigarette, now reduced to a stub, smoldered in the ashtray. My promise to quit had crumbled along with my resolve. As I lay in bed, the phone call replayed in my mind. David's desperate plea the cryptic warnings. It all felt like a surreal nightmare. I grappled with the conflicting emotions of fear and confusion, uncertain of what dangers lurked in the shadows. Days turned into nights, and I found myself caught in a web of indecision. Should I heed David's ominous advice and distance Mason from Todd? Or was it all the ramblings of a distraught father? The air in our home felt charged with an unspoken tension, and Mason, sensing my unease, became increasingly curious. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the lawn, Mason broached the subject again. Mom, why can't I go to Todd's anymore? Did something happen? I sighed, grappling with the internal turmoil. It's just... I think it's best if you spend time here, Mason. I want you close, that's all. But why, Mom? Todd's my friend. Is something wrong with him? Mason's eyes held a mixture of confusion and hurt. No, sweetheart. Nothing's wrong with Todd. It's just... I trailed off, the words catching in my throat. In the following days, I observed Mason from a distance, torn between protecting him and allowing him the companionship he so desperately sought. The invisible thread that connected him to Todd seemed to tighten, defying my attempts to sever it. As the weekend approached, Mason's longing for a sleepover at Todd's intensified. The internal struggle reached a breaking point, and I found myself standing at the threshold of a decision that would reshape our lives. The enigmatic call, David's tearful warnings, and the haunting mysteries surrounding Todd and Mason begged for resolution. In the quiet hours of the night, I sat by the fire pit, the flickering flames casting dancing shadows on the walls. The remnants of a cigarette burned slowly in my hand as I contemplated the path ahead. The choices I made would unfold in the tapestry of our intertwined destinies, unraveling secrets buried deep within the folds of our suburban existence. Logic in the world had just been raptured away. You did see them, my thoughts repeated. You did see the deep, dark wells. As quickly as all my self-doubt left, a scrim of dread filled the empty spaces. Did it scare you? I asked. Well, a little, Mason replied absently. He said not to be, though. He'd show me how to do it, too. I grabbed his shoulder, making him jump. Suddenly, he didn't look so sure. He didn't do anything to you, right? I questioned, my tone urgent. Mason looked confused, as if I were the one talking crazy. No, listen. I know he's your friend, Mason. But I need you to promise me that you won't see him anymore. Mason's gaze flicked back to mine, his eyes wide with betrayal. What? He stammered, and tears began to come down. But I don't want to, Mom. I need you to promise me, I repeated, 
the words cutting like razors scraping down my tongue. After much hesitation, he tearfully replied, I promise. I hugged him, closed my eyes, and surrendered to the cruelty of it all. For the rest of that hellish week, I kept my ears tuned for the knock at the door. For whatever reason, Todd never used the doorbell. Inevitably, the knock came behind the frosted glass of our front door. I could see Todd's vague shape teetering on his soles. When the door opened, he smiled up at me. Hi, can Mason come out and play? He asked. Sorry, dear, I smiled back. Mason can't play today. The corner of Todd's mouth lifted as his neck cocked to the side. Well, can he come later? No, I don't think so. I'm sorry, I said firmly. His nose wrinkled, and the skin between his eyebrows creased. Okay. I closed the door, watched him leave, and that was that. It might take a few times, but eventually the message would sink in. Leave my son alone. I felt a sense of pride in that. What could possibly better protect a boy than his mother? However, when I turned and saw Mason's cold eyes from the stairs, the pride all but evaporated. When Todd returned the next day, I gave him the same answer. Then the day after that, and the one after that, I couldn't even refuse to answer when he knocked. Otherwise, he'd just sit there and wait, knock again, wait some more, knowing full well we were home. Four straight evenings of it. And poor Mason, he had every right to despise me for this. No parent could want to wall themselves between their son and their best friend, his first friend. But really, what choice did I have? We were drifting apart, orbiting even farther away from one another. He was my prisoner, and I was the judge sentencing him back to a lonely world. Surely he'd make new friends, right? The world was full of them, and if anything, this was proof that he could find them. That thought helped me cope anyway. When the knock came for the fifth time in a row, my tolerance had run out. Todd wasn't catching on, and to make matters more irritating, it was eight or so at night this time. Part of me hoped it was someone else. Maybe a neighbor bringing a package by that was wrongfully left on their doorstep. But I knew better than that, and I was not allowing this to go any further. Mason was doing his homework at the kitchen table when I passed by him. No acknowledgement whatsoever. When I pulled the door open, Todd was standing beneath our porch light, both shoulders hunched over his ears, as though expecting me to smack him. And perhaps, verbally, that is what I did. Go home, I said assertively. We're done. No more of this, all right? Can Mason come out to play? He asked sorrowfully, as though it weren't after dark. No, Todd, he can't, and he won't the next day or the next. Now go home and stay there, I insisted. His small arm rubbed his sleeve nervously. It's really dark, and I don't want to walk home alone. Can I use your phone to call my parents? I felt absolutely cruel, but I also knew the game that he was trying to play. You walked here on your own. You can walk back on your own. As I moved to close the door and end the conversation, Todd made his eyes disappear. The darkness washed over them quickly and seemed to curdle in his sockets. A thickening, horrible texture. His face became milky wax, the sad child disappearing behind it. Beads of, perhaps, sweat dripped from his temples, and one ran into his eye, vanishing into the void. I want to come inside, he spoke, the sorrowful note in his voice also gone. My heart slacked to a slow throb. I felt the need to pinch my side, to tweak it hard enough to draw blood and wake me from this moment.
between the dead, shriveled lips, I could see the decayed tips of black teeth. Can I please come inside? He asked. No, I said semi-reactively, his black, craving eyes pleading. Narrowed at me. For a moment, I actually thought they started to cry, but it was the darkness dribbling down his cheeks, oozing like oil slicks. But I just want to play with Mason. The sound of it, the sound of that horrible face saying my son's name, snapped me out of the shock. I slammed the door closed and quickly locked it. Mason stood stiffly in the kitchen. His expression, only a shimmer of consciousness, vacant as a sleepwalker. Mason, look at me, honey. It's all okay. Everything's going to be okay. But his unfocused eyes were not facing me. Three firm knocks came from the door. And when I turned to face it, a dark shape lingered behind the frosted glass. A tall figure, taller than any adult, was hunching to look inside. And from behind the single pane that separated us, its vague shape didn't move. Todd's childish voice was still calling, Can I please come inside? Don't you want to play, Mason? Don't you want to play? I could feel it watching us like static vibrating the air. When I tried to move Mason, he refused to budge, staring with empty eyes toward the evil thing behind the glass. Heavy as he was, I scooped him up in my arms and bolted for the stairs. It won't break in, my thoughts uttered. It isn't allowed to. That much I'm sure of. If it wanted to get in, it would have by now. It needed to be invited and I shut both of us away in the bathroom upstairs. When the sounds of the front door finally stopped, Mason snapped out of it. He was confused, like he just missed everything that transpired. I wasn't sure whether to consider that a blessing or not. Perhaps it was, and perhaps also it was not God that answered my prayer. It was impossible to digest what happened that night. Sometimes, I'd linger on the stairs, right on the top step, and watch the doorway, wondering if the glass would suddenly darken, if Todd's voice would slip through and ask to come inside. One night, David had left a voicemail on my phone. She's gone, his voice whimpered. It got what it wanted from her, drained her dry, and now my wife won't wake up, and it's left us. I don't know what it wants from your boy, but it wants something. And no matter what, don't you let it back inside. The message cut out after that, and he still won't answer my calls. Todd never did come back, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Strangely enough, the one least affected by all of this was Mason. I was worried to see him fall back into that distant bubble. But that isn't what happened. He started to make friends with other kids around the neighborhood. New friends, normal friends. He'd become a real social butterfly. Despite my brain ripping itself apart to understand what I had seen, I at least had that comfort to cling to. Seeing Mason happy made me happy. Lately though, I've been feeling strange. It's been harder to feel motivated about things let alone get out of bed in the morning. Even my appetite has started to dwindle, and day by day, I've been growing increasingly sapped and lethargic. I don't know what's wrong, but it's getting worse. Mason's been helping me around the house, even going out of his way to play chef and make me things to eat. He's a good boy, but sometimes, dear Lord, I catch something in his eyes something that shouldn't be there. But it's only a trick of light. Please, God, let it only be a trick of the light, 